I'm, uh, I'm Ed Pickering. I'm a, an academic at University of Manchester. I'm also a research area lead for the Henry Royce Institute in the UK too. Uh, and yes, I'm number 83 on the list of theses on Harry's website, which is an insane number, isn't it really? But yes, uh, here's number 83 giving his little talk. Okay, so okay, so where did it all start? Well, of course, it all started. Uh, I was sitting next to Chris, in fact, in T001 Lecture Theatre in the Department of Material Science and Metall Metallurgy at Cambridge. This is the room here. In fact, when I was being uh, lectured by Harry, I was sitting on the other side next to Chris and Harry's hair was a little bit greyer than it is in this picture now. And of course, the lecture theatre was a bit fuller as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so we had uh, Harry Steele's uh, lectures. And here are the lecture notes. I've managed to find the scanning in of my lecture notes. Um, so here's, um, here's a, yeah, the, the front cover. There's one of uh, the Bain strain, uh, when you talk about Martin site, and there's a question sheet. And I'm gonna swiftly move on before people realize that my notes are wrong. Okay, um, so yes, um, th those lectures were fantastic and really uh, inspired me to, to do steels. Um, Chris has talked about uh, Harry's communication prowess and um, none more so than on YouTube really. And one particular favorite amongst our year group at Cambridge, uh, this was our undergraduate year group, was this video, and I think we probably account for 500 of the 595 views of this, where Harry talks about making hot chocolate, and it's an ex exceptionally instructive video, starts by um, uh, asking, by, by instructing you to pick the right mug, and Harry's, it's quite difficult for Harry to do that because he <laughs> apparently has hundreds, um, and the, the stirring, the making of the, the concentrated um, suspension is the critical bit of this video and uh, Harry talks about stirring uh, and that's very important um, and in fact it's the way that I make hot chocolate now and, I can't, and it, it's the best way to make hot chocolate so um, one of the many contributions that Harry has made uh, to, to my life. So I'm going to talk about my PhD project now so this is a PhD uh, that I undertook with Harry and this is the first time uh, Harry and myself collaborated really. Um, and it was on macro segregation in steel ingots. Now, I'm not going to talk about too much about the industrial um, driver for this, because, again, it's all a bit confidential, well, a bit sensitive, I should say. Um, but needs to say it was looking at macro segregation in very large steel ingots, up to two or three hundred tons that might be used to create uh, pressure, high integrity pressure vessels. And this was a, a, an actually a topic that was quite new to both Harry and myself. I, I think it's probably fair to say that it was fairly new to you, Harry, or, or maybe that's not fair. And um, so it was really an adventure for both of us. Um, yeah, and I'll talk about the figure on the right in just a second. Okay, um, so what is micro segregation? Well, micro segregation is chemical segregation, the scale of the dimensions of the casting, so a bit of a mouthful, but typically on the scale of centimeters or meters. And it's not what you would call a new phenomenon, by far, far from it, in fact. And here is um, a, 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 a sulfur print from nine, a, a, a 1926 British Iron and Steel Institute report. And in fact, I've got the report here. I've also got the uh, um, reports from earlier in time. Uh, so they knew that the homogeneity of steel lingots was a problem back then. Um, unfortunately, it seems to be for, have been forgotten by various people over, over time and, uh, and that sort of thing, much as uh, a lot of uh, this sort of thing uh, happens with this sort of thing. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not a new phenomenon at all. Okay, um, how does macro segregation arise? Well, it arises um, firstly from micro segregation, essentially. So we, to understand it, we first need to know about micro segregation. So micro segregation, oops, micro segregation is the partitioning of alloying elements, in other words, solute, between the solid and the liquid during solidification. Okay, so hopefully you're fairly familiar with that, but I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail. So in general, in steels, apart from maybe with aluminium, but most other elements, uh, enrich the liquid of steels, okay? And uh, for some reason, my, uh, my it's, it's uh, being a bit finicky with moving on, but anyway, and, and most alloy elements de are depleted in the solute. So when we have a mixture of uh, solid and liquid in the mushy zone of, of our castings, then we find that um, in general, the concentration of the liquid is greater than the concentration of the solid. And this is really important, okay, for understanding macro segregation. Um, uh, so yeah, in other words, if we have a dendrite, we have a mushy zone, the liquid will be depleted, um, uh, sorry, the liquid will be enriched and the um, 
uh, the solid solid uh, that it's in contact with will be depleted in solute in, in the alloying elements. Okay, and this, of course, if you freeze that and you just consider microsegregation, this is a sort of uh, pattern that you might see. So you have um, uh, enriched into dendritic liquid and depleted uh, dendrite arms. Okay, so um, how does that micro microsegregation lead to macrosegregation? Well, there are two key mechanisms. So the firstly, first one is the settling of solid grains in the bulk liquid. OK, and I'll have a, I've got a little animation about that in a second. And the second mechanism is the fluid flow of interdendritic liquid. So I'm going to address both of these in turn. Um, and is my slides going to... There we go. OK, so yes, let's talk about the settling of solid grains in the melts for, to begin with. So if you imagine you've got a big ingot and it's solidifying, you've got all these dendrites poking into the uh, in towards the middle of the casting. There's actually a lot of fluid flow, and we'll talk about fluid flow in just a second. And this means that fluid flow, thermal stresses, all sorts of different things can, uh, can lead to the fragmentation of dendrites. So the dendrites rip off and go uh, and fly into the bulk liquid. And when they do that, um, they, under the action of gravity, um, settle. So the, just a reminder again, the solid is poor in alloying elements. And essentially what happens, hopefully you can see this dodgy animation, uh, that all these crystals rain down to the set to the bottom of the casting. Okay. And remembering the solid is always pure, uh, poor, sorry, it's always poor in elements relative to the bulk. Uh, and that gives us essentially a cone of segregation at the bottom of the ingot. And for some reason, my Oh, there we go. Um, it's really taking its time move, uh, moving on with my mouse clicks. Um, so yeah, we get a cone of negative segregation and that is what this is at the bottom of an ingot. So these are essentially all the crystals that have rained down um, uh, towards the bottom of the, of the ingot during solidification. Second mechanism, fluid flow of interdendritic liquid. So if we have a, a dendrite surrounded by enriched liquid, Let's look at ahead of that into the bulk liquid. Well, if we, the bulk, the bulk liquid has the bulk concentration of the alloy. So let's assume that's 0.2 weight percent carbon. If we look at the enriched liquid, that will be enriched in carbon and elements like silicon and other elements. And let's take an example here where we've got 0.3% carbon. This basically means that the enriched liquid is less dense than the bulk liquid, okay? And this means we have all of a sudden, uh, we have a convective uh, flow uh, set up, a buoyancy driven flow that will arise, and that looks like this. So the um, interdendritic liquid rises and the um, bulk liquid sinks, relative, and they do that relative to each other, okay? And this delivers um, a few things. Firstly, enrichment at the top of the ingot, and secondly, uh, a segregate formation. These are also called channel segregates or close lines. Okay, so if you look at the ing an ingot here, you get that enrichment at the top because all the enriched liquid floats. In this particular case, it does anyway. Sometimes it sinks, but uh, a lot of the time, because it's enriched in carbon and silicon, it floats. Uh, and you also get the uh, these ghost lines forming. Whoops, there we go. Uh, so we get these these a segregates forming, which are these channels of liquid. And just to go in into a little bit more detail about the a segregate formation. Um, when the enriched uh, fluid uh, moves, often it moves upwards, and in doing so, it crosses isotherms, basically, and it moves to warmer parts of the casting. So you introduce enriched liquid into warmer parts of the casting. And when you do this, oh my, my, it's really taking its time to move on. I don't know whether you can actually see it, and I just can't. Oh, there we go. Okay, right. And um, it causes remelting of the solid and increases local permeability. So if you imagine you've got very enriched fluid, solid rich fluid moving from here, let's say, to over here, crossing isotherms, and in so doing, it tends to melt the interdendritic um, liquid, uh, interdendritic, uh, sorry, not the interdendritic liquid, it melts the solid around it and it forms these channels. Okay, so basically we have something like this, where the, in, uh, the rich liquid moves upwards and it crosses isotherms and um, uh, melts the solids. It's a bit like adding, having a, a mixture of ice and water and adding salt into it, um, uh, you know, increasing the solute concentration that tends to melt the solid. That's essentially what's going on here. Um, and I think on the next slide, which is maybe why it's taking its time, uh, I've got yeah, an example of this. This isn't my own work. I'll make that very, very clear from the start. This is beautiful work done by Shevchenko et al. But this is of channels forming in the indium gallium system. Now, this uh, you have to use indium, indium gallium to see these channels. 
uh, form because you can't really do it on steels because it's too it doesn't uh, it's not transparent to x-rays enough um, but anyway um, so in this particular uh, um, this, uh, an, a radiograph a set of radiographs um, in, in real time indium forms the solid in this indium gallium alloy and gallium enriches the liquid and it floats because it's the lighter element so what I'm going to show you here is and this is the reference for this beautiful work down here is this happening so what you can see here is we've got uh, it's actually being solidified directionally from the bottom so we're about to see some dendrites of indium poking out and as the indium's forming it's rejecting gallium into the liquid and that liquid is then it, which is, appears red here is then floating uh, quite beautifully and you'll see as it comes in from the bottom that we have some uh, dendrites of indium there and they're rejecting this this uh, enriched all, all the solute into the liquid that's enriching the liquid and it's it's making the liquid float in this particular case so really a brilliant example of this solutal uh, driven uh, or solute driven convection and what you're going to see here is this uh, dendrite, I hope you can see my arrow, uh, my, my mouse, uh, is going to grow across this channeled front here and is now going to be remelted by the uh, by the flow of this enriched liquid through it. So can you see that? So you had remelting of the solid there and all of a sudden you've got these beautiful um, channels, these deep veins of enriched uh, liquid that are flowing up uh, here through the um, uh, through through this particular um, very small indium gallium casting. But that's exactly the same way in which channels form inside massive steel castings. In fact, okay, um, and yeah, there we go. So these channels here um, forming this almost like volcanic looking thing in this particular co color scheme are formed in exactly the same way as you just seen there okay because the interdendritic liquid floats okay so that's briefly how um, uh, um, how, uh, how that all works so can we investigate it experimentally is, uh, is, is one question that people often ask and yes, we can. We can we can chop open the uh, an ingot and examine it um, uh, in a post process sort of way. So what you're seeing on the right hand side here is the section through a 13 ton ingot, and basically we subject that to an XRF map. So essentially EDX mapping using uh, X-rays at large scale, and uh, 71,000 data points later and a month worth of continuous scanning, and that's what you get. So you can investigate it if you have the resources. Um, the problem is that it's uh, it's very very costly, and that's yeah a, a bit of a, a bit of a pain with uh, with all this, as you can imagine. And also, it doesn't tell us what's going on in real time. We have to sort of infer it post process. Okay. Um, if you're interested in that work, uh, there's the link to the paper there. Um, we can investigate it in real time using more transparent systems, transparent to X-rays or transparent optically. Um, uh, so, for instance, that Indian, Indian gallium system, or in fact, uh, one that's transparent uh, to optical, uh, optically is the ammonium chloride water system. And uh, in ammonium chloride water, the dendrites are like uh, metal dendrites, are form, uh, dendrites very similar to metal dendrites, and they also form channel segregates. And I think in this, uh, yeah, I've got a video here. So in this particular case, the ammonium chloride, that's forming the solid, and it's rejecting water into the solution of ammonium chloride and water. And that is in fact floating. And when that happens, it forms channels. And I think you can almost see some of the channels here. And at the same time, these channels, the fluid flow through these channels rips, oops, uh, I'm just, I should have gone back, um, rips out dendrites and throws them into the, uh, the bulk liquid. So you can see this crystal rain that I was talking about earlier in real time, you can see it happening. Uh, and basically what you end up with is a load of these equiax crystals uh, near the bottom of the ingot. So um, yeah, really, really beautiful experiments. And really the, the, um, the, the, the video here doesn't do that justice. Okay, so another question is, can we predict it uh, using modeling? Because that would be great because experiments are very expensive. Um, well, yes, we can, we can use macro models uh, that couple together equations for many phenomena. So they might be fluid flow, uh, solidification, solid movement. And um, here is a, a list of those uh, equations that are related to those. Now, I've never done any of this, um, but there are many groups, uh, a few, well, a few groups around the world that do do this sort of modeling. And one of them is the group of Wu and Ludwig in, um, in Austria, uh, Leoben. 
and they couple together all these equations and uh, try and predict the, the, the microsegregation pattern that happens, okay? Uh, and it's really impressive work. And um, the problem is with that sort of approach though, that the macros models are expensive to run, they can take months on supercomputers sometimes, and they cannot predict the formation of these uh, channel segregates yet in, in large ingots. And that's basically because you really need a grain size of, uh, uh, sorry, a mesh size of around about a millimeter. And of course your ingots like two meters across. It's really, it's really uh, very difficult to do. Um, and yeah, so you need millions of nodes essentially in your model. Um, so, uh, and sorry, my size keep flicking, uh, flicking around. This seems to be a problem with my uh, PowerPoint at the moment. Um, so the alternative that I explored during my PhD with Harry was the uh, use of a, a, a Rayleigh number criterion. And here is a Rayleigh number. So this number essentially tells you how strong the fluid flow is likely to be. In other words, how likely you are to form asegregates. So the higher this number, the more likely you are to form asegregates. So let's just go into, uh, delve into this a little bit in uh, detail. Firstly, as you might expect, the difference between the bulk liquid and the interdendritic liquid, uh, the density difference is, is really important. That goes on top of this equation. The higher that is, the more, um, the more uh, fluid flow you're gonna get, okay? There's a reference density in there. There's the permeability of the dendritic um, mushy zone, okay? So if you have a higher permeability, you're more likely to, um, uh, to, to for get these uh, channels forming. It's also gravity. Um, there's the viscosity of the liquid. So the higher the viscosity, the less likely the fluid flow is, gonna, is, is going to take place and the less likely you are to form channels. And then finally, you've got the velocity of the solidification front. So if you solidify something really, really quickly, you don't allow these channels to form. You don't give time for the, uh, the fluid flow to take place, okay? Uh, so the idea with using this Rayleigh number, and this was sort of uh, pioneered by Christoph Beckman, or at least the use of the Rayleigh number in this constant context was pioneered by Christoph Beckman um, uh, in the US. Um, uh, so the idea is when the Rayleigh number uh, reaches a critical value, we should get fluid flow. So what you do is you create a simple thermal model of your um, of your ingot. You input uh, various. Uh, well, you can uh, just looking back at this, you can get some of these values from things like JMAP Pro, um, and you can estimate some things based on dendrite arm spacings and that sort of thing. Um, and using the results of a thermal simulation, then you can essentially plot that value out through a casting, which is what I've done on the right hand side, and compare it against where your um, a segregates actually start to form. And in this case, you see that when the Rayleigh number, it happens to be when it reaches greater or equal to seven, it seems that sort of seems to be the cutoff between uh, where we get segregated liquid and where we, uh, where we get, uh, or where we have non-segregated, sorry, solid to begin with, and where we have um, this, this segregation starting to take place. Um, and there's another point in this slide, if, it is, if it's going to arise, oh, there we go. Um, so, the key thing, actually, not that this is a bit of a detail now, but you can't actually use this particular, um, uh, the Rayleigh criterion to tell you where asegregates will be, only where really where the good material is, because you can see in the middle here where definitely should be uh, lots of fluid flow according to the Rayleigh number, there is there are actually no channels, and this is because other phenomena are taking place. But essentially it gives you an indication as to where you first start to have a lot of this segregation taking, uh, this fluid, this interdentic fluid flow taking place, and hence forming channels. The reason why I've, I've talked about, um, and I've called this talk across the length scales is because it, during my PhD with Harry, uh, Harry was you know, very encouraging that I also explore the microstructure the, in the depth of the microstructure using TEM um, uh, uh, whilst doing all this macro scale stuff is because the scale bars in my thesis go across at least six orders of magnitude and uh, probably even more if I was to dig out some of the really, really high uh, high res TEM. Uh, well, not it wasn't proper high res TEM, but the high magnification TEM that I did. So this was a case of you know looking what's inside those channels, and in this particular case, working out what the what the ferrite carbide orientation relationship was. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the, very much across the length scales, and this in fact has influenced a lot of what I tell my PhD students now, uh, now from now on, which is basically the first thing you do when you get, ever you get steel through the door is you give it a macro etch because it's probably gonna be segregated and we need to account for that. Um, and 
in relation to the, uh, to the PhD, I can't thank Harry enough for giving me the freedom to do really whatever the hell I wanted, to, within reason. Um, and that involved a lot of spending a lot of time at Sheffield Forge Masters. So this is me uh, thermoc thermocoupling up uh, the, the ingot mould to cast this ingot. The, the centre one is um, a very hot and um, bothersome two days that I spent uh, in a workshop in Forge Masters hand polishing um, a, a steel ingot. I never want to do any metallographic preparation like that again. And on the right hand side is the XR, automated XRF mapping kit at Geotech Limited in the UK, where we essentially took this almost near mirror finish sort of uh, ingot slice and subjected it to XRF mapping. And fortunately, I, then I could just go home and program the robot to do, uh, to do what uh, I wanted it to do. Also got to thank Harry for uh, during those PhD years um, for providing such a wonderful group and also got to provide, uh, thank the group so much for their support, um, their camaraderie and yeah, some fantastic friendships um, uh, were, were made in PT Group. These are all the people I've taken their um, uh, photos off the, off the website and there were actually uh, lots more people in the department as well. So and some of uh, the, those people, including Chris, uh, is, is on the call today, of course. And um, what about my current adventures in steel then? Well, I'm going to give you a real mismatch uh, of, 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 of projects here and, and work. This was a, something that uh, some of you might find particularly interesting because it was about performing uh, synchron X-ray diffraction and dilatometry simultaneously on the same sample in, uh, yeah, uh, in, uh, in sort of continuous cooling curve type scenarios. So I'm going to explain some interesting things on, uh, in, in this data here. We've got the ferrite lattice parameter, and this is when ferrite first starts forming. And you see actually here what we've got is two transformations. We've got the transformation to altromorphic ferrite at this cooling rate, and then actually we've got a transformation to Baynard later. And what you can see is that, uh, and, and yeah, I should also explain, this is the dilatometry curve, which you can see goes to basically 0% uh, as we cool down in temperature, and we get, uh, yeah, I don't know, 60% um, ferrite here. And uh, then also the, uh, we've got the same measurement of ferrite, um, uh, the fraction of ferrite from um, synchrotron as well. And also what we've got is the, is the austenite lattice parameter. And the interesting thing, if you pick all this data apart, is that basically the ferrite fraction you get from the synchrotron doesn't quite match the ferrite fraction you get from the dilatometry, okay? And the reason is because when the ferrite forms, it um, not only does it cause a dilatation uh, or a dilation because it's BCC forming in FCC, but it also rejects carbon and theosinite, as we all well know, um, and this um, causes the austenite to expand. So you've got to be really careful when you uh, interpret dilatometry data, because if the uh, if when when you um, uh, cool the sample down. If you measuring a dilatation, and there also could be carbon diffusion into the austenite, partition in the austenite, then the um, the apparent ferrite amount of ferrite you get might not be the actual amount of ferrite you get because you've assumed that all the all the expansion is from ferrite, whereas actually a significant amount of it, and it's actually highlighted here in the pink, um, is from carbon enrichment of the austenite. So you've got to be uh, pretty careful uh, with respect to that. But that was some really interesting work that I did um, uh, at DESI and also in uh, collaboration with Lee Connor at Diamond. Um, so yes, that's uh, there's uh, that's some current um, uh, stuff in steels. Other other current stuff. Um, these are the sort of various stuff uh, things that um, I'm involved with. All of course have originated in some way from this uh, love of steels that Harry. Um, uh, Harry, Harry delivered to me in my PhD. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in any of these, uh, please do, do let me know. So I'm doing things like uh, designing novel post weld heat treatments for ele massive electron beam welds, uh, both in low alloy steels and nine chrome steels. I'm working with Josh, who's just sitting at the other side of this partition wall here. Um, uh, on look at, well, Josh is doing a number of things, but uh, included in that is the um, uh, development of a CCT type curve or the tweaking of a CCT type curve, uh, type curve predictor, sorry, um, 
uh, and that's you following sort of like a Caldi uh, uh, method of CCT prediction rather than MUCG, but of course we're comparing it to MUCG. Um, doing some microstructure fingerprinting. Um, so this is recognizing different bits of microstructure uh, with a postdoc called James uh, Moffat. I also do some irradiation of steels. Um, and this, this is a uh, radiation of um, uh, Euro for steel, use of fusion up uh, down here. Also producing some really interesting uh, microstructures um, uh, through, uh, this is my PhD student called Mark Taylor, who's um, essentially taking some of the uh, similar alloys to the ones that Chris was working on and subjecting them to really extreme, rapid and uh, uh, cooling, heating uh, type of experiments and uh, look at examining the microstructures of those. And then finally, uh, uh, Raul, uh, another one of my postdocs is looking at hard facing silicide steels. So yeah, any, if any of those um, uh, of interest, do get in touch. And finally, okay, so that's, uh, that's enough of uh, me. I now want to talk about uh, memories of, uh, of, of 2013 and memories in, of my PhD in general. So um, yes, many, many of you be, will be aware that in 2013, uh, Harry, uh, maybe, it was probably late, late 2012 actually, Harry approached uh, Chris and I and said, oh, you know, it'd be great, let's do a, let's do a, uh, a conference and let's do it differently. Let's have one that's really open, no registration fees. Let's go, okay? And this uh, and this is what we did, um, and it was amazing because Harry went to went to lots of sponsors, and we managed to get, you know, thousands of pounds to make the registration free, and it was a fantastic event. Um, and here's Will, who many of you will recognise as being the host of uh, previous talks in the seminar, seminar series. I think I've aged and lost most of my hair. Will hasn't aged a day apparently in the last eight years. Um, and here, yeah, here's a, here's a, com a photograph of that conference and it was a uh, yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic time. Um, also in 2013, and Chris alluded to this, we all, it was also a, a big adventure in terms of moving uh, the department actually. And we moved from the uh, new museum site in Cambridge over to uh, West Cambridge. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say was, uh, Harry, just thank you for absolutely everything. And I guess I can thank you on behalf of my research students that are hopefully benefiting from the uh, supervision that you gave me as well. Uh, and very best wishes for your retirement. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. That was uh, very nice. You know, the work you did on uh, segregation uh, is going to become even more important because of the idea of building small nuclear reactors, you know, which is a Rolls-Royce venture. Yes. Funded yeah. Something like 400 million pounds. And the, one of the problems with the steels like SA-508 and so on, is actually not the substitutional atom segregation, but more the carbon segregation. I don't know if you recall, but uh, there was a big problem with the French uh, yes. pressure vessel that was created. Uh, yes, was it, was it Flamanville? Now I forget. Um, but yes, it was a it was a it was a um, a French uh, French vessel. They found a lot of carbon segregation at the top of that uh, in the in the head forging. I think of that vessel in two thousand sixteen. I don't, I don't know how many tens of millions of pounds worth of money that's cost them, but a huge amount of money. And, and it's basically delay, delay, yeah. you know because these uh, you don't make many of these objects. Yes. So, so one of the, uh, you know, people think that you can eliminate this by heat treatment, but you can't. No, no, it would take thousands of years probably to get rid right. of so the, the to carbon, go yeah. through this uh, alloy design and process design to ensure that things are at acceptable levels. That's uh, no, that's right. And there, and there are certain things you can do to try and um, yeah to try and mitigate this. Um, so yes, so this question from Suresh about the um, capability of accepting predictable heterogeneity and castings uh, at a different length scale um, and eliminating the need for homogenization. So yeah, we of course never really homogenize these uh, the, the 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 ingots. They're forged about for hundreds of hours potentially, or held at sort of um, above twelve hundred we see for hundreds of hours. But actually, even the dendrite arm spacing is too course so you might be talking secondary dendrite arm spacings of like a millimeter two millimeters something like that so that even there they're really too coarse to, to homogenize properly and what we have to do is yes essentially just design it out or engineer it out and deal and essentially deal with it so what they do 
what you can do, for instance, is well, and what they do do is they chop. Hopefully, you can still see my uh, my screen here. Is that they would chop off the top of this ingot, um, and maybe some people with this French case didn't chop off as much of the ingot as they should have done. But that's just speculation because I don't actually know what happened. Um, but you usually chop off the the top, say twenty percent of the ingot, and that removes a, a huge amount of segregation immediately. And then also what you can do is you can punch out the middle of the ingot and yeah, you can, you can essentially machine away bits and pieces. The other thing of course, is that you can try and live with it by making sure that none of these uh, features intersect the surface. Um, and yeah, that, so that's, that's uh, another way of sort of designing that in and try and predict where they are and, and design that in. And um, you can try and eliminate them as well. If I go back to the array number, you can try and eliminate them by, uh, for instance, you can make a hollow casting um, and a hollow casting, if you're making a pressure vessel, is a really good way to do things because then you increase the, the solidification speed and that uh, reduces the amount of time you have for um, uh, the segregates to form. And also what you could do is you could play around a little bit within the spec of the alloy chemistry to make sure that this density difference is as low as possible. So for instance, you can pick the lowest carbon and silicon levels that you can get your hands on and increase the moly levels. And maybe you might get to a point where essentially you haven't got the same driving force for fluid flow. And there are, there's evidence that, or the indications that some, that some uh, um, uh, steel grades, in fact, the intergenerative liquid sinks because it's more molybdenum rich uh, and yeah, you don't have any of this sort of uh, horrible segregation or, or at least as much of it. So um, yes, you can design it out um, uh, as well. And so you, yeah, you can design it out engineeringly uh, from an engineering casting standpoint, you can design it out to some extent using the alloy composition and then the rest of it, you just got to um, chop off uh, bits and try and shift that segregation from, away from where um, you need to. Um, uh, you, you want it, yeah. So unfortunately, when you're casting tens, hundreds of tons of steel, you're going to get this segregation. So you just have to manage it as best we can. So. so Ed, thank you for your presentation. I have just a question, which is quite elementary. So more technological than, than, uh, than uh, would say theoretical, which is where when you go continuous casting of steels or special steels, I mean, you can go up, uh, I would say, close to one meter diameter, and you apply uh, electromagnetic steering in the mold, and then you uh, also apply one or two um, electromagnetic steers when, when the bloom is going uh, down the line. I wonder whether it would be possible in the future to apply such huge steers, because they are huge steers, even to ingot casting, because this would be a rather empirical, after all, way of uh, uh, limiting um, basically macro segregation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, a great, great point, uh, uh, actually, Fabian. I, if I remember correctly, I did look into this during my PhD. So I think they already electromagnetically stir, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, things like alum, big aluminium uh, ingots, because, uh, and then that's to generate lots of and distribute the equiax grains and to get a good grain structure as well as homogenizing. And um, my understanding is that some people have tried this in the past, uh, Fabio, but um, but I I think it's very, what if you don't do it well and completely, and bearing in mind, you might be working with something that's two or three meters across, you end up just with a huge mess of segregation that no longer you, you you know so you don't know which bit to chop off anymore <laughs> uh, to some extent so it may be possible to do this um, it, and in theory it should be right if we if we somehow make sure that all of our liquid is uh, is uh, is mixed together um, and all our grains are, 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 are mixed together I think the difficulty is that as soon as you get these channels forming if if you, then you're just going to be smearing out that fluid flow and those grains into particular areas, um, then you might end up with a bigger problem than you would have if you sure than when you not an easy game with the exactly yeah, yeah. tons so, of, uh, of liquid steel going around. But yeah. but the point is that uh, in um, in the current applications they are. I believe quite close to one meter dia diameter in continuous casting, which is 
after all, a big diameter. Uh, I think in, in, in the future it should be possible because after all, uh, uh, the, the, the solidification uh, patterns are not that different. If you see the, the, the macro uh the the macro section if you see some of, of the details of the the the, the, the micro segregation should be exactly the same so i think that should be some sort of parallel in in the industry they are trying basically to eliminate as much i mean about the, the steel making industry which is not uh, academia as much as in good casting because they want to uh, to, to make uh, as much as possible automatic uh, processes in casting so continuous casting is good but for larger sections it is still impossible and maybe it will be in in, in the future as well maybe there could be something related to uh, something which is more for light metals sometimes also for for copper alloys which is semi-solid casting which is also mechanical way of uh, agitating the, the, the solidification uh, uh, the process, but, but this could be in the future. Yeah, yeah, and no, indeed. Um, just on, I'm, I'm remembering back to the, some of this work now. Um, uh, you're, you're, I absolutely agree with everything you, you, you said. And of course, if we move to a hollowing at time design, then maybe the distances get even smaller and we can mm -hmm. work with this. Um, there is, of course, uh, electro slag uh, remelted ingots mm -hmm. um, where you would think you also get some of this stirring, but again, you can still get these channels mm -hmm. forming in that case, and you've got to it. Yeah, so I, I absolutely agree that it is entirely possible to do. I just don't know whether anybody's got the time and the money to to have a go at doing it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is the same with. Well, I guess we could say that about most. This could be, yeah. Um, <laughs> because it's it could take some trial trial and error, and when we're talking about two hundred tons, then. Uh, yeah, you've got to have some deep pockets, I guess. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of so another way of totally eliminating um, this the macro segregation, of course, is to hip hip a massive ingot. But then, of course, you've got problems with ferritic powders um, and hydrogen and oxygen and all sorts of different things. And of course, you could also try and build it up using some sort of wire additive technique. But then you've got you know lots of certification for uh, lots of little welds being made all the time. So yeah, there are lots of different uh, um, uh, sort of uh, ways in which it could potentially um, uh, you could conceive of, of making these uh, these sort of large pressure vessels in the future. But each of them uh, will involve you know a lot of development work in order to um, to, to solve all the problems. Thank you. Oh, so an interesting uh, point Thanks, from. Fabio. Yeah, two more questions in the. Sorry, in the sorry yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sure. um, uh, so Andy mentioned that he's not convinced that stirring will influence a segregate channel segregate, um, and yeah, I, I'm I not sure either. I don't know whether yeah, you know how 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 precisely how the fluid flow. Uh, how the how the magnetic steering works in that in that case because the, the thing is as long as you have in, uh, enriched into interdendritic liquid um the, then you, you you know you you're at risk of getting these channels forming but maybe if they're cut off by the fluid flow i don't know whether or you know or the, otherwise disrupted by this fluid flow that might help um but yeah i also saw and not that i'm now just uh, just chatting, uh, but um, I also saw, you know, that there are studies from the 1950s and 60s where they try to rotate and spin the ingot, including spin the ingot, spinning the ingot on an axis, and apparently it just made things worse. So, um, yeah, there we go. People, lots of these sort of things have apparently been tried um, before, but maybe there are uh, opportunities with, you know, more powerful magnets and that sort of stuff, and uh, more powerful systems to do the stirring. <laughs>